Yeah, uh, we're uh, really pleased to have with us today uh, Lorraine Mangione and Donna DiCello. And they've uh, together written a book called Daughters, Dads, and the Path Through Grief. And uh, they are uh, psychologists. And uh, uh, I, we've run into uh, Lorraine as part of the uh, Italian American Psychiatric Association or Psycholo Psychological Association. And uh, they have some very interesting things to say about the dynamic uh, that uh, is entailed. And I um, highly recommend uh, their work and uh, their book. And uh, let's uh, uh, begin with uh, uh, Lorraine. Uh, uh, you want to tell us maybe a little bit about yourself too, uh, to introduce yourself better than I can. And uh, um, you can take it from there. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to do a few little welcome and introductions, and then we're going to start sharing a PowerPoint. Um, so, uh, but we can still see you apparently, at least still see some of you uh, when we do that. So um, I really want to thank both Carla and Dominic, and I know them both from IASA and then from when APA was in Chicago last year or two years ago, the two of you gave that amazing talk to the um, Italian American Psychology Society, which we really appreciated. And I got a little mini tour from Dominic of some of the great places um, that were unfortunately taken over um, in terms of the Italian, um, uh, Italian settlers in, in Chicago. Um, your bio of us is that you sent out was great. Um, the only thing I would add to mine is that uh, another one of my obsessions is studying female fans of Bruce Springsteen. And as you all know, Bruce Springsteen is half Italian, so it fits with Italians too, but I'm not talking about that today. Um, and I would also just like to say that um, my background is in the many boroughs of New York City where my parents came from, but then they moved to Connecticut to raise us. They were they were kind of like going out to the sort of the Wild West of Connecticut at that time. And Connecticut is filled with Italian Americans. In fact, I just want to mention that the first Italian American governor in the country, governor in her own right, was um, an Italian American in Connecticut. And Donna, if you could say a few words. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I want to thank everybody for inviting us here. I'm really thrilled. Um, I have this week off from my practice, which is the reason that I'm able to join everybody today, um, because otherwise I would be doing clinical work right now. Um, so I'm really thrilled that I was able to do this today. Um, the work that I've done with Lorraine on Italian American issues, um, grief and beyond um, has been very, very important to me. And I know my dad is probably smiling down today as we're doing this um, because he was really my champion and the one who really um, kind of initiated me into doing this work. So I'm very happy to be here. Great. Great, thank you. And I have a couple of other thanks. Um, I always like to acknowledge Bia More, who you'll hear a little bit more about, Italian-American artist, because um, she and Anthony Riccio, who happens to be here, um, gave a talk in Boston at the Italian-American Psychology Group years ago. And that was the first time it occurred to me, wow, maybe we can look at Italian-Americans and study ourselves. Um, so that was really important. And then Anthony Riccio connected me to this. And I also like to give a shout out to all the Italian American women who participated in our research because the book would not exist without them. They opened up their hearts, their homes and their his family histories to us. And I will also say sometimes they fed us. I'll just mention that right now. Mm -hmm. um, it was an honor to do qualitative research with those women. And um, we were overwhelmed by the number of women who wanted to participate and we could not include them all. Um, and I also wanna mention, we had one of the greatest research assistants, Megan Lyons, who lives around Chicago. And it just occurred to me this morning to send her this link. So I don't think she's gonna make it, but 
She does not have an ounce of Italian American blood in her, but had worked at an Italian American restaurant for years and loved the study. Um, so a little bit about the structure of today's presentation. Um, there's gonna be a little bit of an introduction to how we came to do this work. Um, some thoughts about our main themes, and then we're gonna present some of the words right from the book, right from the research, from childhood until after the death of the father. And even though we are dealing with death and mourning here, um, this is not typically um, a depressive kind of, I mean, it's so, there's such warmth and relationship here. And given the pandemic that has gripped the world, we'll also make a few comments about it in relation to our work and what might seem important. Because this is not history. This is not looking back, even though the deaths, the losses were in the past. This is stuff that we can take and move forward as Italian Americans. Um, and we will pause partway through for questions or comments, and again at the end. Um, and now I'm going to screen share. So let's. Let's see what happens. Everybody see that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. And we see a small, I see a small screen of you too. So. Okay. Okay. Um, so as part of the introduction, I would like to introduce you to my Aunt Mary and Uncle Sam in 1936 at their wedding. And I just love that hat. And I, I, my own wedding hat was kind of mirrored after that. Um, this was, Aunt Mary grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan and has recently passed away at age 102. But until about her mid nineties, she still cooked macaroni with peas and onions, minastra, baked ziti and meatballs. She still traveled, visited friends and family, still sewed, read the papers and played poker in the neighborhood and at Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. She spoke to her husband in this picture almost every day of her life from the time of his death in 1974 until her death. Lots of different things, sometimes just chatting, sometimes looking for advice and consultation, sometimes angry at him for leaving so soon telling him she misses him, giving him news of the family, sharing laughs. When their granddaughter tragically died at age 33, I don't know if Aunt Mary would have survived that horror without talking to Uncle Sam. She had her favorite chair where she sat in communion with him and talked with the picture for a little part of each day. He was gone, but he was never completely gone. And now I'm, I'm actually so glad they are together again, finally. So think for a minute, some of you may have an Aunt Mary in your life and her lessons may be different, but I think it is very helpful to think of what we have learned from our families, as well as what we are teaching our children, nieces, nephews, and grandchildren, because there's a lot of values here to pass on, even as we know that the Italian American community and psyche is, is changing and evolving. So why study Italian Americans, daughters and dads and loss and grief? There's three themes of this book, the daughter and dad relationship from birth until death and beyond, the process of grief and mourning, how it feels and how the path changes and Italian American culture. Um, so here were some of our reasons. One is our relationship with our own fathers. Donna and I were having lunch in West Hartford and we were both had lost our fathers. And we noted that people were not that interested in the fact that our fathers died, that there was much more support about losing mothers. And we wondered about that. We wondered if there was something special or different about the Italian American daughter dad relationship. And as we talked, we knew we wanted to do a real study, but we also knew we wanted to write something accessible to the lay public. And I would just say, I had a great relationship with my dad complicated, we could argue at the drop of a hat. So I knew there were many layers to tell. There was not just one story. Um, the richness of the Italian American experience and psychology's neglect of Italian American, um, which led to the, the chapter that you see up on the screen that came out of Calandra. 
Um, but we were, we, we were confused that so many other fields such as history, geography, sociology, the arts, you know this, study Italian Americans and we didn't. And it's not as though psychology has not had eminent Italian Americans such as people like Phil Zimbardo or Joe Matarazzo. So we thought it was about time that somebody in psychology looked at this. Um, and psychology has focused mainly on abusive daughter-dad relationships and we wanted to branch out. Um, we didn't wanna focus just on pathology between fathers and daughters. That's what so much of literature, memoir, and psychology focuses on. And psychology is really only beginning to notice more normative and even more positive relationships. And it's that deep attachment that makes it so important. And that's what this book about is about deep attachment. And believe me, we have stories of pain and struggle, ruptures that get repaired and some that don't, but these are fundamentally um, what I would consider more normative and not just pathological stories. And finally, incredibly changing views on loss and grief in the academic world, in the hospice world, in our culture. Um, they, they're kind of coming to understand loss and grief in a way that fits with us. It's finally moved beyond that idea of stages and closure where like everything ends and you have to get over it to the possibility of continuing the bond and continuing the relationship after death. And it totally resonated with our views and with our culture. Um, I had two aunts who, when they were alive, spoke of their mother, my grandmother, in some little way every day of their lives after she died. Um, so Donna will go into this a little more, but Italians could have written the book on changing notion of grief. Um, and it's really important to remember there's not one single way, not one path of grief. And now I want to introduce you to my dad. <laughs> what I want to know is, and I wish I could see hands raised, were all those soldiers from World War II just incredibly handsome? I mean, it's almost, it's almost ridiculous. Um, and you can really see how my dad entering the army really was like a boy. And this is only like probably two years later, he's like a seasoned man. Um, uh, and the significance of World War II for Italian Americans becoming American and the significance of World War II for several of the women in our study was, which is why I, I'm using these incredible pictures. Um, my daughter was recently able to apply for a certain scholarship for graduate school because she was the direct descendant of a person who had fought in the European theater for the allies in World War II. And that was a real moment of remembering and honoring my dad just recently. And like Donna said about her dad smiling down, I just felt like my dad was, was I could say was in heaven, hopefully he's already there, was in heaven when she got to do that, um, apply for that scholarship. So uh, I'm gonna turn the speaking over to Donna. So I'd like to introduce you to my dad, Leopoldo Giuseppe Di Cello. Um, that's the official name on his birth certificate, although he went by Leo. Um, to everybody else, his friends and close family. Um, this photograph has always been really, really special to me. And I actually write about this particular scene in the book. Um, we lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, grew up there in a working class um, neighborhood, but we had these incredible roses that grew along the chain link fence in our backyard. And my father loved those roses. And some of my favorite moments watching him prune and tend to those kind of going in um, close to smell them. Those were some of my favorite memories of him. And this photograph was taken, I actually think it was um, right before I was born. Um, he had been tri trimming the, the roses and my mom had captured him with the brownie camera holding the roses up to his heart. And I actually have, um, I'm looking at a copy of that photograph in my home office right now um, because I, I have it hanging here. 
Um, he was a hard worker. He was a member of the Rat Pack. He was a very complicated man, very tender, and also could be um, probably the most stubborn person I knew. Um, he loved his daughters and um, really was, I mentioned before, really was my champion, really encouraged me in a way that was not always common with Italian fathers to get educated, to you know, go as far as I could um, in school and was always, always very, very supportive of my education. So I thank him every day when I see that photo. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the evolution of what it means to be Italian. Now, a lot of the women in our book also talked about during World War II, um, they tried, the families tried to hide their Italianness. They wanted to blend in and there was a whole movement of not speaking Italian at home. A lot of our women reported that, that they were discouraged, um, tried to speak, um, encouraged to speak English. So then 70s, 80s, it became, you know, Italian food came onto the scene. It was very popular here. And um, there was that kind of stereotyping of what it meant to be Italian. And there was a lot of oppression during that time. Um, Italians, as many immigrants that came to this country, suffered a lot of hardship. Um, they, a lot of um, prejudice. Um, my father often talked about um, when my grandparents came, they, when they emigrated over, they moved to Pennsylvania and um, they were not accepted into the neighborhood um, very welcomingly, welcomingly um, when they moved there. And then as time went on, there would be more achievements in education, um, Italian income um, also increased. As uh, Lorraine had mentioned, our governor, El Grasso um, in Connecticut um, became involved in politics. So we started to see more Italian faces um, on the political scene, people starting businesses, people in the arts, um, sports and entertainment. So Italians became much more um, on the scene and in the public eye in a way that they never had been before. So Lorraine and I, this is this quote, Italians tend to keep their dead with them. And Lorraine had um, somewhat uh, touched on this earlier. It's from a wonderful book on family therapy by Giordano, McGoldridge and Cladges, where they um, go into the ethnic backgrounds of families um, and how to work with them in therapy. And there's a chapter on Italians. And we thought this quote really spoke to what our book was all about, because American culture, you know, tended to, tends to view death. Um, you know, you pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you resolve the death, you get over the death. And as Lorraine had mentioned earlier, too, about her, um, her aunts talking about her grandmother every day, Italians tend to, you know, celebrate and revere and honor uh, the ancestors and talk about them um, every day. Um, this is, you know, you see this in families and relationships that has really helped the Italian community and culture have a sense of resiliency. A lot of that, the symbol and ritual that Italian families have when it comes to death, um, you know, contribute to that. I had um, an aunt who um, was a professional mourner. And that was very common in Italian culture. And um, I thought that was a very interesting uh, way to make pocket money, but um, she would go to different um, funerals in the town where my grandparents grew up and um, you know, do the keening and the, the wailing and the crying for the family to help them really express the grief. It wasn't something to be ashamed of. Um, religion and spirituality, um, if a family was, um, you know, most Italian Americans come from the Catholic background, that was very interwoven um, into how they honored the dead. And we talk a lot in the book about, especially the women that we interviewed, how creativity helped transform the grief 
into um, something greater than just sadness. So we had a number of questions um, when we started our research. And one of them was, what is the relationship between Italian American fathers and daughters been like? As Lorraine had mentioned, we did not want to focus on, we know there's a lot of grief and a lot of pain between a lot of um, Italian daughters and their dads, but we wanted to focus on, based on what our own relationships were with our dads, what are the positive things that have come out of this? And we really wanted to look at it in a developmental way, going from childhood to long after the dad had passed and how daughters kept um, their dads alive and the ways that they still memorialize them. And that leads into how the loss of the father had been experienced by the daughter. So we had a lot of stories of, you know, deep, deep grief, a lot of relationships that were very complicated and the grieving didn't happen immediately at the time of the dad's death. Um, but we wanted to know how they really did experience that and how their relationships with their dads, whether they had a close attachment to them or whether it was more fraught, how that impacts how a person grieves. And what has been the impact of Italian American culture on those relationships? So how did these daughters with their dads kind of live the experience of being Italian in American culture? Um, so here's, here's our, um, like the basics of our participants. Um, we did interviews, they were almost all face to face. I think we did one or two phone interviews. Um, we asked that they not have experienced abuse or abandonment. Um, so, and once they, um, there are a couple of reasons for that. Partly, we didn't want the book to be mainly about that, but also, um, when you're doing an uh, uh, internal re uh, a review board, institutional review board, it would have been a lot uh, more difficult um, to if we did not have that as one of our criteria. We never asked anybody that specifically. Um, wide range of ages, socioeconomic, and time since death from my dad died six months ago to my dad died 30 years ago. So very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to stop screen sharing for a minute now. Um, uh, and um, to see if people have comments, thoughts, feelings that are coming up that they want to share briefly. So if we could just take a couple minutes right now, I'm going to stop sharing. I did it. OK. Um, and I don't know, Carla, can you see if anybody, I don't know if you do hand raise or. Yeah, we can see if somebody wants to use uh, the hand raise in the chat is one way that they can, or if, uh, if you, you just want to unmute and, and speak out, that's fine with me too. Yeah, just something brief, comment, mm -hmm. question. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, Connecticut has now become the most Italian state, uh, beating out Rhode Island, little it old Rhode Island. My little old Rhode Island. I'm <laughs> I can't claim that distinction anymore of my home state. <laughs> and we have the best pizza. <laughs> oh, that's a low blow. I, I uh, <laughs> Donna, Donna, don't even say that. <laughs> We're talking to people from Chicago or Rhode Island. <laughs> Rhode Island, so deep okay. dishes in a category based on. Um, I yeah. would like thing if there's no hands up. I don't want to. Um, but yeah. one thing, I when I was I read your book. I have your book on my on my 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 shelf, and I actually just reread the article, the shorter article that you referred me to, that was actually published in Italian Americana a few years back, related to this. And I was really struck by that. Um, that quote that Italians tend to keep their dead with them and how how poignant that is because the tradition you think of um, you know All Souls Day and that's the beginning of the of the Christmas season in in much of southern Italy and that's when your dead ancestors bring little gifts to the children so there's this continuity between generations that's celebrated and also um, how the, the tradition of putting pictures 
on on people's gravestones you know that their 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 image is kept alive and that you go and visit but you don't just visit that you do things there you know you visit them and include the dead as if they were still part of the living and uh when i gave my presentation to the Italian American um, Psychological Association, one of the novels I treated was Tina DeRose's paper fish. And that novel opens up with the family going to the grave of the de de deceased grandfather and having a picnic there. And uh, literally like on, on the grave and including him as if he were still very much alive. So I, I just wanted to point out like that there is that lack of separation that, that that we keep our ancestors with us or that or in traditional italian culture especially southern italian that's very much a part of the tradition which i think is very sustaining so i i really keyed in on that when i read yeah. that in your yeah. article yeah no that's very so italian so italian yeah an italian american i would agree i would agree yeah, even now, we're, the cemetery where we walk our dog, it's an Italian cemetery. And you often, walking through on a Sunday, you see families, you know, sitting in uh, chairs. They have the picnic table out. So that's still still happening, which is lovely, lovely tradition. Any other comments, questions? Oh, OK. okay. Um, Um, so before we, before I launch onto a couple of really good examples, I want to say that, um, uh, we had an overwhelming amount of artistic people, I think, because we went through New York and Boston kind of, kind of, um, venues and met most of the women are named in the book. Um, that was their choice. And I will just say that Helen Berolini, the mother of Italian American literature is in the book. Uh, Donna got to interview her and Daniela Giuseppe, who's been a poet, writer, and activist for about 60 years and still going strong is in the book. And I got to interview her. So um, yeah. Um, and one of the unexpected findings, because unexpected findings are always interesting, was just how varied and non-stereotypical the dads were. And, and you'll hear that as, and, and Italian men are so often stereotyped, and you'll hear that as, as we go through. Um, I will also read these PowerPoints. Um, I don't know if that's annoying to people, but it just feels like they, they should also be read when um, we're quoting people. And the first person we're gonna quote, I do have to say, Anthony Riccio also put us in touch with her. This is Rosa DeLauro, who is a Congresswoman from the New Haven area. Uh-oh, why is that not advancing? Okay, resilience. When my dad came here, he was put into the seventh grade in the US. He left school the same year because he couldn't read or write the English language. They made fun of him. This particular story is interesting. They asked him to define the word janitor. He didn't know what janitor meant. So he drew on his Italian, which was genitori. And obviously it was not the definition of janitor. It was parents or parentage. Teachers, classmates laughed. He left school, never went back for a formal education. He was probably one of the most, well, in two respects, both with music and books. He had probably one of the finest libraries and was one of the best read individuals you have ever met. He educated himself through reading and I have all of his books, classics, politics, history, everything. He could, he could quote Emile Zola. In terms of music, my parents took me to the opera at the Met at age nine. I saw the opera Aida. He used to sit down with me and listen to the symphonies. And he'd say to me, do you hear the French horn? I heard nothing. You know, what did I hear? All of that was self-taught. So great example of resilience and the father-daughter relationship. Rough wisdom, this one always makes me tear up, I will tell you now. My dad was a very exuberant person, not wildly so, but lively. He was a good, responsible man, despite some decisions he made in his life. He was a loyal husband, a devoted father, evident by the amount of time I spent with him. I had a close relationship with him. I think that my father had a rough wisdom. It wasn't a profound wisdom. Some of the things I remember him saying when I was growing up spoke to that. 
when my first child died, I remember him saying to me, it should have been me, not the baby. That's how he was, salt of the earth. He was that type of person too, very stoic, very pragmatic. I have read this many times. I can never, I cannot not tear up. I'm sure other people could see their dads in that too. Um, understanding, because I have a twin sister, I was my mother's pet child and my sister was my father's. And then it switched. A little later in my teens, I just realized more and more how close and similar I was with my father. Being at that age, I was having the usual issues girls have with their mothers, and we had some differences in our personalities that were similar, but in terms of the way we dealt with people, my father and I were similar in how we looked at people and how we appreciated connecting with people. When I had boyfriends that went wrong, when I talked to my mother, it would be, ah, forget it. I can hear that. <laughs> that kind of thing. But my father, he would talk about it at a level that I understood because we connected. He knew he understood me. Again, a very psychological, they may not have used that word, but a very empathic psychological relationship. Uh, this is Bia More now, and you're gonna see a couple of slides with her. Education and career choice. One of the key instances which still reverberates in my life is that when I was a junior in high school, I was getting straight A's in math. Geometry, which I loved, of course, I've become a sculptor. It all makes sense. It was the year of Sputnik. My dad insisted on taking me to MIT to meet the Dean of Admissions because he wanted me to be an engineer. So, so, so put yourself back in that place. I was thinking of being a social worker or a nun. Of course, artist was in there, but I had already decided that artist was too selfish, that I wouldn't be able to help the world, having grown up with a social worker mother involved with many immigrants, displaced persons after the Second World War. I had a very strong social conscience at a very early age because I met survivors of concentration camps who had lost their whole families. So I remember the dean looking at my grades and saying, there's no reason why you couldn't come here if that's what you would like to do. Although I felt really embarrassed in my Easter suit with my mom right beside me and my father, I have often reflected on his faith and his strong belief that it never made any difference that I wasn't a boy. There was always a strong belief that I could do whatever I wanted if I just went for it. So here's Biamore with her father, home on leave. And something that happened to this other slide um, he's graduating from Boston College. I think it says 1936. Um, and Boston College was so Irish at the time. This was an amazing thing for an Italian graduating from Boston College. Um, um, here's a, a little bit of a dip into creativity and memorializing and how important that process was for many of these women. Um, Bia Mori has a book and a, um, an exhibit called, and my Italian is not as good as some of yours, but The Lifeline, Filo de la Vita, um, through Ellis Island and beyond. This is just one piece of it. And that red line in there is the lifeline. Um, and that goes all around. You'll see in the next one, you'll see a picture of the whole thing that she worked on for years as a way of memorializing her family. Um, well, yeah, and this has been at um, Ellis Island. The one you're gonna see is at Ellis Island and it was also in Naples um, and seven generations of her family. And she often said um, from Southern Italy to America, some left for adventure, some left, most left for survival. These are kind of uh, objects of daily living um, with that red thread going through. Um, she called these two glass domes reliquaries. These are special places, which reliquaries are special places for remains of saints or objects saints have touched. 
and this is her family's reliquaries. The one in the back, so this is at Ellis Island. The one in the back is called Grandmother's Bundles. And those are bundles from Conchettina's dressmaking tied by her hands exactly as she left them, as well as her notes. And I resonate with that because my family was very involved in the garment district or sewing at home. I can't sew anything, but I resonate with this anyway. And this front one is called Reliquary to the Two Anthonys. That's her grandfather's pickaxe that he used to dig some of the foundations of Harvard University, as well as the Boston Harbor Tunnel and a portion of the winemaking cask. And then her father's Book of Knowledge Encyclopedia. So it speaks to the labor of the original immigrant and then the fruits of the son's study. And again, how times change. Um, so this is this is a this is a big version of memorializing. I don't expect all of us to be doing this in our houses. Um, Donna, over to you. Sorry. So we had mentioned that the relationships um, of the women that we interviewed, you know, talked about being very close to their dads, having a very um, unstereotypical relationship with their dads but it doesn't mean that there wasn't conflict. But many of the women talked about not only having the conflict, but also being able to resolve the conflict. And this quote from Andriana um, speaks to that. My sister had an operation and my brother went to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and he was going to a ball game with my father. And I remember going over and I said, you know what, you're going to a ball game and you have a daughter being operated on. I bet she was the oldest daughter too. And he looked at me and said, I don't mean to be disrespectful saying it, dad, but why? He looked at me and he said, honey, you know why? Because I can't handle going in that hospital and seeing her like that. And he started to cry. I said, please, I'm so sorry. He said, don't apologize. Whenever you feel you got something to say, you say it. And if I think you're being disrespectful, I would say so. Such an open, open man to say that. Certain things that stay with you, and that was one big thing right there that gave me the answer, which I was glad. I had thought, oh, because we're girls, because boys were always the number one thing. So she really learned and was able to kind of pivot and see her father in a different way in that moment by his openness. Um, I think for me, one of the um, situations in the interviews that I felt the most honored by was hearing how the women said goodbye to their dads at the moments of their deaths. Um, you know, births and deaths are those, you know, kind of mystical privileged moments in a person's life. And I certainly felt that very privileged to be with my dad at the moment that he died. Um, so many of the women shared their stories with us about what that was like. And one of them who um, had one of my favorite stories was an artist from New York City by the name of Lulu Lolo. And when I interviewed her, she gave me this story. I was in the room with him. I brought my father's book of poetry. I went there and I knew that he was dying. I could sense that. I was there with my dad and two of my sons. I had to tell him that it was okay to go, to leave. I told him that and I read him his poetry. I wanted him to know it was okay to die. My two sons said, he's waiting for Alex, my other son. As soon as my other son came, he passed away. After that, I felt his spirit in the house for a long time. There is a funny story from when he was in the hospital. He always played lottery numbers. How many dads have done that? <laughs> um, he's in the hospital and he wins the lottery. And he says, this is hot shit. I'm in the hospital and I win the lottery. It was almost $2,000. We all said, you know, you won the lottery. Let's have a procession and we'll get a band, a Dixieland band. We prepared his funeral and decided to have a procession from Mount Carmel Church here down the street 
band and all. And Lulu's dad was um, Pete Pascal, and he actually started one of the first settlement houses in Harlem, East Harlem, um, for Italians who came um, to this country. So he was very, very well loved. Um, this is a, a photo of his hat on the left. Um, she uses that, Lulu is um, part of what she does, she's a street performer, and she uses his hat in some of her characterizations. She also does a wonderful, um, and she's done this in it Italy, actually. Um, she takes on the persona of St. Francis Cabrini, and she, you know, talks and phil phil philosophizes um, in, on the streets of Italy, which must be something to see. And she also has done um, a piece on the garment workers in New York, the women who were killed in the um, Triangle um, factory fire. And on, oops, <laughs> and on the right, um, she does these, her apartment in Harlem was filled with these incredible um, art pieces. And she also had a room that was dedicated to the city of Paris because she really loved Paris. And this is one of um, her art pieces where she has kind of embellished her self very uh, grandly, I think. Um, can somebody tell me the time because I've lost my clock doing screen sharing? It's 316. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, as you can see, we uh, had some very interesting, uh, I mean, we had all sorts of people, but um, it's kind of fun to show some of the, the more artistic. Um, so, in psychology, this idea, um, mourning involves not the breaking of an object tie, object means a tie with a person, but transformation of the attachment into a sustaining internal presence. I like that idea of an internal presence um, that we can keep somebody with us. Um, there were certainly regrets, and this is something to think about because we will all have many more losses, regrets about what we didn't talk about, what we what could have averted his death, how we might have reconciled. Um, and when I think about the pandemic, it's especially important these days because so many deaths are sudden and unexplained. Um, you've seen a lot here about creativity and memorializing, but we're not all doing that major artwork. Many women created altars in their house, um, some type of cooking that their, that their dad did, some gardening wrote in their journals, read what others had written, and dreams are creative acts on, that there's other ways to be creative and to memorialize. And that's one of the things we've lost so much this year is the memorializing. Uh, religion, spirituality, mystical experiences were all real important um, premonitions. I mean, that's such a big part of being Italian, uh, being Catholic, most of them were raised Catholic, but they weren't necessarily, they, they had gone in a lot of different directions, but kept some of that love for, for mysticism, um, shooting stars the night he died, speaking to them, those kind of experiences that I think are so important. Um, and, you know, just thinking about um, how to hold him in our hearts, I, I, I wrote down Papa Memorial because my daughter, we have this thing. And even though she's now in her mid twenties, we still do it when something comes up that reminds us of my dad. She's like, oh, Papa Memorial. Like we have these words. A lot of people, people did a lot of funny things with cookies. I will tell you that a lot of dads liked certain cookies, um, but these were all important things. And we just have a couple more slides um, of some of the women and then a little ending piece. Um, this is Christine Palamadesi, who some of you know, um, and the idea of still exploring even after the death. Last year, while I was doing one particular piece of art, I realized I've always been attracted to war and war zones and thinking about war. I was doing a triptych, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and World War II, and became curious about my father's experience in World War II, what he experienced and what it must have been like. And I wondered why he never talked about it. 
I sent away for his Navy records to find out exactly where he was when, where he went. I became curious about that part of his life. And this feels so Italian to me. I have a strong belief that time is not linear, that my father is here in all phases of his life with me as are other people I know. Depending on where, my, where I drop my consciousness at a certain moment is where I find the father I have, even back then when I was alienated from him. And of course, the loving, affectionate father is there too. And we really haven't talked about food enough. And so Patricia here offers something that I like to end with. Um, what my sense of Italian is, is that you always remember him at celebratory events. Holidays, I make food for my dad's recipe. So he's always present. He had a way of making sauce, which I think I've learned well. I incorporate cleaning anchovies and frying the zucchini flour. I make a big feast of the things that he would make and the things that he made that I loved or his style of making chicken soup. The other thing he made when I didn't feel good, he always made Swiss chard. When I went to Calabria, that seemed to be a very traditional dish. It was never fancy cooking. It was rustic cooking. I met with her in September and she was taught, she had blue grapes for us. And she says that um, when she sees those, the grapes maturing, I feel he's in the refrigerator. And her friends are very funny. They say, I see your father's been here when they see certain things in her refrigerator. Um, having a dad who was a cook, I resonate. This is the book. Um, the important part of the title that Dominic didn't say is Tales from Italian America, because um, they are tales and I love that idea of tales. And we have just a couple more comments. Yeah, I'm going to go through um, these very quickly to make sure that we have time. I know a couple people had questions. Um, I don't think we could talk about a, pre a presentation on grief if we didn't address the pandemic that we've all been living through um, over the last year. And we all know the disruption that this is meant for people who can't mourn in the usual ways. And I think that the takeaway from this slide is the impact that it's had on Italian communities where um, death rituals are often um, very, very important and people have not had that outlet that they have been able to um, kind of process and go through the usual um, trails of mourning. But there is resilience. And I think that is one of the biggest um, take homes that I think I would, I would like to see people take from our book that there has been deep grief, but there is also resilience. And one thing it's important to realize the feelings as grief and avoid the idea of toxic positivity. People may have heard that um, term in the vernacular lately, where you have to pretend that everything is okay and that you're okay and that you're you know, kind of pushing through. And it's been an extraordinary, extraordinary year where people um, have suffered a great deal on many different levels in many different ways. So to you know, really allow ourselves to, to feel not okay if that is what's coming up and that if one is in touch with grief. Um, thinking about what they miss the most a lot of the women um, talked a lot about that in our interviews about what they missed about the most about their dad. And I think that that's a very um, positive and um, kind of forward thinking question to ask oneself. Um, who will I become without the loved one present? Because identities change when you don't have that person. Family dynamics shift when you don't have that person. Um, make new rituals the importance of staying connected and channeling energy for others, focusing on other family members and other people in the community who might be suffering even more and making new meaning from the death. So this terrible thing has happened and a lot of the women we interviewed um, talked about that. This terrible thing has happened, but what meaning can I make from, from this? How can I honor my dad? How can I go, go forward? And we like to end with.
one of the um, most resilient and creative people that I've had the honor to know in my life was my first cousin once removed, um, Angela Stella, Angela Di Cello Stella, Michela Angela Di Cello Stella, who was my father's first cousin. And she had been married um, at a very young age to our Gable Stella. And he had a massive heart attack. Um, they had only been married um, about eight to 10 years. And he was only um, 40 something when he passed away. So she was very young. She was much younger than he. And um, she was in her 30s. And one of the things that she did, she you know, was grieving for um, a long time after losing him. And then one day she decided to um, take all costume jewelry that he had given her and started collecting costume jewelry from friends of hers and started making these incredible art pieces. And I'm very, very um, pleased to say that the one on the right, um, that Christmas tree, I have hanging in my own home now. Um, she died at the age of 106. And this was at her 100th birthday party. And she was, she asked me to help her get dressed. And she was very, very particular about the placement of that brooch that you see on her lapel. I had to uh, repin it, I think, five times. Um, but she was an incredible woman. She belonged to Seroptimus International, um, an organization for those of you who aren't familiar, um, does worldwide um, good works for women and, and girls. Um, at her 100th birthday party, we were having a little gathering. One of the, it was a whole weekend, but one of the gatherings was a luncheon. And somebody had given her one of those time life books that kind of span um, the decades. And somebody said, Aunt Ange, because she had come to a page um, when um, we landed, the United States landed on the moon. And she had come to that page and she was saying, remarking on it. And one of her nieces asked her, Aunt Ange, do you think you would ever, you know, be interested in taking, you know, a trip like that? because she had traveled all over the world. I think there were maybe three countries that she hadn't visited. And she thought for a moment, and then she said, well, I would think about doing it if I was 80. <laughs> and here she was at 100, but she wouldn't do it then. Um, so I think she's been kind of the epitome of resilience for me and really turned her grief and mourning into something um, very beautiful in her artwork and also in her spirit. Thank you. And I'm gonna stop screen sharing. And um, I don't know if we have to stop exactly at 4.30. We'd hope to have a little bit more time, but this never works out. Um, questions, oh. comments? Carla? Um, may I ask a question, please? Sure. Yeah, I think Carla. Oh, yes. First of all, compliments for your book, uh, Lorraine and Donna. I think that you had an excellent idea. It sounds like a most promising book. Um, I do identify with the statement that domestic affections play a fundamental role in our lives. And I realized this also as a school principal. I grew up in Chicago and when some of my stories are about my dad who passed away there and taught me many things, lifelong things that such as getting an education is important and going on in your life. And he is always alive in my memory. Um, I um, was thinking, yes, that it is rooted within the Italian culture that we forever are forever attached to our um, dead ones. Um, we have the graveyard poets like Ugo Foscolo, who speaks about the correspondenza d'amorosi sense, you know. Uh, so we have that in our literature. But my question was about 
living between the, the two worlds and of course realizing that they're very strong points in having um, figures so important as our fathers and our mothers. But what is the limit in your opinion between caring and over caring? Um, do you believe that sometimes or in any way um, Italians also as Italian Americans um, would sort of go beyond the caring into the over caring with um, some consequences of this? Um, I'm gonna make a couple of comments and, and Donna also. Um, psychology has wrestled with the idea of what's called complicated grief. Does it exist? How long should you grieve? Is there a point where it becomes more harmful? And um, certainly that's one of the concerns with the pandemic and all the disruptions that there's gonna be more of complicated and ongoing in a way that's, that's not beneficial um, where you know, a person stays in bed for the next three years or a person can't do anything else. So there, there certainly are ways that, that it could um, impact your life and the life of those around you that's not healthy. It's just hard. It's always really hard to draw the line of what's complicated grief or, um, and what's not. So Donna, you're your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with that. And especially um, with the pandemic, I think, um, and some of my own patients, and certainly some of the women talked about um, the overcaring that you're referring to, Maria, where they felt like they didn't have their own identity, or they couldn't do things that um, they felt were important to their own lives. So yeah, I think there can be um, that line. And um, I think of one woman in particular, which I think speaks to the issue of complicated grief, um, who had difficulty with daily functioning with her grief. And I think that is the point at which um, it can become more challenging. Is anyone still wearing black forever as a widow? Uh, is, is that thing, is, is it still happening in Italy and among Italian Americans? I certainly saw it in Sicily and Southern Italy like a number of years ago. And since I was supposed to go there last May and you all know what happened to those trips, um, I, I haven't been to Sicily in, in probably about 20 years. So I don't, I don't know. Um, Hi, this is Carla. I'm back. I'm sorry, my internet went back just as I was about to hear whether uh, uh, Donna's first cousin once removed would have gone to the moon or not. So I don't know what her answer was. <laughs> she said if um, she was 80, she'd consider it, but not at 100. Oh, I think her Carla might be frozen again. Yeah. Other other comments, thoughts, anything that this has brought up for you, either about your own family or about Italian Americans in general. And thank you, Maria Rosaria. That was that was a great question. Thank you so much for your answer. Just a, a footnote uh, that uh, Giordano that you mentioned. Is it uh, Joe Giordano that I know yeah. from way back? Uh, is he still uh, doing work? There's two Joe Giordanos. One is because this one is really hard to find. We actually tried to connect with, with him years ago. He was a social worker and all I could hear was that he moved to Florida. Um, and of course my cat who's got an Italian name just joined in, um, Luca, <laughs> this is Luca. Um, but no, this is probably, if there's a Joe Giordano who writes a lot that you've noticed um, with Italian American stuff, it is not that Joe Giordano. This Joe Giordano disappeared. Do you remember Donna? We were trying to like find him at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And even um, I had contact with the woman, the main author, of, the first author of that book. And I think I think even she wasn't sure, clear where he was, Monica McGoldrick. Mm. So, yeah, it's not the Joe Giordano that you that shows up. Anthony, does this sound like people you've interviewed? 
I'm asking you a question now. You're muted. How about now? Yeah, you're good. <laughs> Everything you say resonates. I don't know. I so, I don't know where to begin. Really. <laughs> I mean, I could just maybe I should listen. This is your show, so I don't <laughs> I don't want to get started. So I'll just leave everybody with. You want to know how it hits me? I think my father uh, encapsulated it all. You talk about death, and you know your commitment. The key word that you say commemoration is the one that always hits my cord deep. And because I'm always trying to commemorate, that's what I do. I try to save, I try to save our, our, our stories. But I remember a story, a little, a little uh, proverb my father gave me that he was uh, towards the end of his life. And we were just sitting having a cup of espresso at my mother's kitchen table. And you know, he wasn't a dramatic guy, just a regular working class guy, you know? And uh, we were just sitting there sipping on an espresso one day and he looked at me and for just a second pause and he said to me, you know, Anthony, he said, if I die and you forget me, then I'm dead. But if I die and you remember me, then I'm alive. Yeah. So don't forget me. Yeah. And, oh. And, and I wasn't digging for that, but we have often quoted you on that. But I mean, you ask, you know, it's just. It's yeah, just, no, that is, that is, that, that is the essence of a lot of this. That is perfect. That so, is a great, thank you. you. Uh, so thank many you. things you say, I mean, strikes home. The whole idea of the aunts and the just the different ways we commemorate ourselves, I think is so important. Not just that we do it, but that we document it and that we, we celebrate it. This is a celebration. This talk today to me is a celebration because it's keeping our commemoration alive. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, Joseph Tusiani's uh, uh, suggestion of why he was a poet or what his meaning was because all of the people who went before, the Italian American immigrants who went before, uh, uh, he was the product of all of their suffering. Yes. And, uh, I, uh, I, I think all of us in Italian American studies or in any ethnic studies are trying to keep alive the memory of the, uh, of the folks who went before us and uh, who suffered on our behalf. And uh, so I think that's um, uh, it's very apropos as to the whole profession is, or to my whole raison d'etre. Well, I think it's great you're doing this, Dominic. I have to say it again, Lorraine, well, it's great. Well, uh, well and, and I think everybody will appreciate this. On, um, I have at least two or three students who couldn't be here today because it's the middle of the day and they're on practicum working. And um, they are so interested. They are Italian American, they are young and they are so interested in wanting to hear this um, on the recording because I think we, we need to think about the future too, and we need to keep living these values and passing them along to children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, because these are all really important values. And a lot of them get sort of like overlooked in contemporary culture. So I'm thrilled that a few of my students, my, what are they, millennials and Gen X, whatever, I know I'm, I can never get that right, Gen Z, and um, they want to Millennials and Gen Z they are now, isn't that awful? Millenniums and Gen Z, yes, I'm yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I think we need to all like be moving this forward, taking what we've learned um, for our own Aunt Mary's, our cousins, um, that, uh, Second, wait a minute, what do you always say, Donna? Second cousin once, first cousin uh, once first removed. First cousin once removed. We need to bring those forward and from our fathers. Um, well, I think especially now too, because you know the times that we live in, the future is so uncertain. So this in a way can be a gift to give to future generations some grounding in their culture that I think you know younger people going forward are really gonna need. So, so this has been great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, if yeah, there's a last is... minute comment or question, we're fine, but we don't want to keep people. Um, 
Carla, Dominic. This is Carla. I'm I'm back. I'm sorry. Right at the very end, I started having trouble with my internet, but this has just been a wonderful presentation. I had one quick question, if you don't mind. No. Nope. Um, I when your article you and in the book you talk about you set out to describe rather than prove, um, and what I mean we're talking about values and passing it on and i work with younger people too in my classes and i think that's very important what were the some of the the real takeaways as far as what makes it a uniquely italian american uh or or, or are they is it just diversity or or, or um just didn't know if there were anything that you say this is something we can talk about as a uniquely italian american part of this uh daughter father grief um journey I, I just I, I would say two things um I would go back to the um that slide that had um Italians tend to keep their dead with them and those things creativity transformation ritual symbol um and certainly I'm sure there are other cultures that have some of these things too but there are very few cultures that are as imbued with a symbolic and metaphoric and almost like otherworldly sense than Italian and Italian American. And I think that that feels pretty deep. Mm -hmm. And I think the, and these things, how they get embodied in the relationship on um, the, the, the father daughter um, that speaks to the importance of family, the importance of creating something, transforming something, the importance of thinking in certain ways. Um, and, and it's not about, you know, even though we have these art artists here, it's not just about, oh, highly trained artists. It's so many of the women um, who had so many different jobs, they just were imbued with this sense of, I don't know, Donna, what else would you call it? Creativity, transformation, resilience, um, mm -hmm. you know, our, you know, the old saying about, they were told the streets were paved with gold. They didn't, weren't told they were gonna have to do the paving um, when they came here, that, 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 that resilience. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the women that we interviewed, whether they were, you know, actual artists or not, each one I think had their own unique way of, symbolizing what the relationship was you know for some it might have been a piece of art for others it might have been you know the father's um who was a carpenter the plane on top of the the door you know to me that's still a symbol of creativity you're taking that and making it into something else so i think they did have a unique ability to symbolize what the relationship was Thank you. That's really beautiful. And I, you know, I just like to add too that there's this idea too that things get transmitted to you that you're not even really aware of. Because as I was rereading your article and I remember reading your book, I mean, I read your your book before I lost my husband, but uh, you know, the ways that I have um, defined my relationship with him fall in line with what many of your the women you interviewed do. And I don't know where that came from. No one taught me to do that specifically, but I do think it comes from having uh, this strong Italian American tradition. And I do find that the rituals around which I have found comforting, you know, are comforting and sustaining and part of very much a part of who I am. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to put it because in, in psychology, we talk about the transmission of intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. but there's also the intergenerational um, transmission, I think of acts of symbolism and acts of ritual that happen without us even being consciously aware a lot of yeah the yeah that's what i was reflecting on. well yeah. i don't want to thank you so much this is just such a wonderful oh, presentation you. um dominic any other final words on your behalf there <laughs> thanks today to lorraine and donna for uh being our guests uh, and uh, thanks to all of you who tuned in today if there's anybody who has a, a final question speak now or forever hold your peace <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Ciao. Oh, grazie, Dominic, Lorraine, and Donna. Compliments. Ciao, Carla. <laughs> <laughs>